This is the lecture for Wednesday, April 1st. We will be continuing our discussion of quantum chromodynamics. And today we'll talk quite a bit about mesons. In fact, the, the whole lecture will be on mesons. So mesons are the combination, now we understand them as being a, a quark and antiquark at its most basic level, although we, we discussed already that it's more complicated than that. You can get all kinds of complexity from the gluons. Now, <coughs> the quarks, it, it turns out, these uh, produce all sorts of mesons, and one of the things people were seeing in the, in the 1950s and 60s was, was that they, they were getting lots and lots of particles coming out from um, these particle accelerator experiments. They would bang things together and just look to see all of the types of particles that would come out. And originally they thought these particles they were seeing were fundamental, but then they started seeing more and more of them, and the idea that these were fundamental particles seemed probably un quite unlikely. And so then people set about to classify these particles that were seen, just like we try to classify similar chemical elements together, to like Mendeleev did for the periodic table. Um, so people were looking for particles that were coming from the particle accelerator experiments that were similar to each other, similar in the sense that they had similar masses, but maybe different charges or some other properties to them. Um, and so uh, one of the things, the things they noticed were, was that these mesons, as well as the baryons, remember the baryons are the ones that have free quarks at its simplest level, and in both cases, they were seeing patterns in that you would see groups of eight. Um, now, we, we actually understand why this happens now, and, and, and Gelman was the per person that, that actually came up with, this, with the idea um, that, that there may be these quarks, that there might be three light quarks um, involved, and so there's actually an SU3 symmetry, so this SU3 is coming back again, but this SU3 is different from the SU3 we talked about last time. Um, that, that was the SU3 associated with the three colors. This time we're talking about a not quite so fundamental SU3, but rather an approximate SU3 symmetry that comes about by interchanging the lightest three quarks, the up and the down and the strange quarks. So it's just the accident that there's three light, three light quarks, and so the group SU3 comes back again. Um, so, anyways, these light quarks then um, give you an approximate SU3 symmetry. We call it SU3 flavor, flavor because these are the flavors of, of the quarks. Now, so when we have a meson, we have uh, three possible flavors for the quark and three possible flavors for the antiquark. And when we write down representations of SU3, the, the standard way of calling the representation is, is by the number of elements in the representation. So the quarks, there are three of them. They, so they are in a representation that we simply call three. Okay? It's, it's sort of a strange notation. If, if we were to call the representations a spin this way, then we would call the spin one-half representation, we would call it two, because there is this, this plus one-half and minus one-half for the spin. Anyways, the quarks belong to the three representation. The antiquarks are, are kind of the same in that they have a three-dimensional representation, but they sort of go in the opposite direction, so it's actually what's called a three-bar representation, but there's still three of them. And so if I put together three quarks with three antiquarks, there's nine combinations. And so just like adding together angular momentum, we can add together the SU3 quantum numbers of this combination and then you end up with nine possible combinations, and it turns out that there is going to be a representation that's called an octet that has eight elements, and there is going to be an element that has only one, uh, one element, which is what's called a singlet, which is this one-dimensional. Okay? This is a lot like, as we said at last time, um, adding together to spin one-half with spin one-half, and we end up with spin one, plus spin zero, but if we write this in terms of this kind of notation, we would write this as, for example, two cross two for two-dimensional cross two-dimensional, 
is equal to the three-dimensional representation plus the one-dimensional representation. Okay, that's just the difference in notations. Now, anyways, um, uh, Gelman was the person who came up with this idea that there are these quarks to explain all of this group theory going on. Um, so he was studying uh, um, this group theory at the time. By the way, the mathematicians had long developed group theory. Um, we've talked about Sophus Lee's work, but, but the physicists were, were not really paying attention to group theory. And there's actually kind of a funny story. Um, my, uh, the person that I learned quantum field theory from, his name's Sidney Coleman, um, Sidney Coleman. And he was a student of, of Gelman at the time. Um, and, and he was, uh, had sort of a reputation for being well-versed in, in mathematics. He, he, he did a lot of reading in, in mathematical um, things. And, and Gelman um, asked Sidney at the time if he knew anything about SU3. And Sidney's uh, reply, he told the class this, that he said nothing. He, he knew nothing about SU3. And um, unfortunately, that was maybe unfortunate for him because that was the opportunity to, to be on a Nobel Prize uh, paper, perhaps, if he maybe uh, uh, showed more interest. <laughs> now, um, the, it, it, what's interesting is, is Feynman um, took the quarks actually a little bit more seriously as being fundamental particles than, than Gelman, but there was sort of a, a rivalry going on at Caltech at the time, and, and so, so Feynman preferred to call them partons. Um, so, uh, but there's, there's actually a, a, a nice little story associated with the term quark that, um, that Gelman used to, to call these particles. Um, he had all sorts of names for, for these particles. He would call them, I, I guess, um, he would change the name. He, he would call them squeaks or squarks or quarks. Um, I, um, but then he found, um, some months later, a line uh, from James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. Um, and in Finnegan's Wake, there's this quote, um, three quarks for muster mark. Sure, he has not got much of a bark. And sure, any he has, it's all beside the mark. And so um, Gilman really liked the fact that there were three quarks in that quotation because there were three, three light quarks that he knew about. And so um, that's how the, the name got started. Oh. And then, so uh, coming back to this, uh, the fact that there's these octets, people were seeing lots of patterns of eights. And so Gelman had a natural description for why these eights appear, because they come about from having a three cross a three bar. You get this eight dimensional representation of, of, of SU3. And so he called this the eightfold way. And again, uh, Gelman was sort of stylish in terms of naming things. This eightfold way had to do with the noble eightfold path of Buddhism. Um, although the, the connection with Buddhism is not really all that clear, it's just the fact that eight appears in both cases. Okay, so um, we're talking now about mesons involving the light quarks, um, namely the up, the down, and the strange quarks. So we, last time we talked about the pions that involve only the up and the down quarks, so things like UD bar, DU bar, UU bar, DD bar, things like that. Um, now we're talking about um, things that also involve the, the strange quark. So we can have the K plus meson, which is a US bar, or a K zero, which is a DS bar. You can also have a, a K minus, which is a U bar S, and a K zero bar, which is a D bar S. Okay, so now we can also talk about something that we call hypercharge. Um, hypercharge is just sort of a, a catch-all term where you add together the baryon number. So remember, this is just one-third for quarks and minus one-third for antiquarks. Okay? Um, and so these... Um, uh, these quarks and antiquarks have, uh, sorry, these quarks have one-third baryon number, okay? Now, strangeness, that's just simply a way of counting um, how many uh, strange quarks you have. Actually, remember the convention is a little bit odd in that you get a minus one for a strange quark, and you get a plus one for 
um, an anti-strange quark. The charmed goes in the correct way. It's plus one for your charmed quark, minus one for the charmed uh, anti-charmed quark. The bottom is, is a little bit backwards again. It's minus one for uh, bottom, and it's plus one for anti-bottom. And then the top is mm, plus one for top, and then minus one for anti-top. Okay. Now, this isospin, uh, this T0, this is the Z component of the isospin, and that just simply gives you, um, for the up quark, it's equal to plus one half, and for the down quark, it's equal to minus one half. Okay. And it's, it's zero for all the other quarks. So if you make these, if you go through these combinations, what you find out that the, the electric charge can be written in terms of these, uh, in terms of the uh, the isospin z component, the z component of isospin or t t zero in this notation plus one half of the hypercharge. Okay, you can check it. For example, the up quark is uh, isospin t t zero is equal to plus one half, and then we have plus one half times one third. That gives me one sixth. So one half plus one sixth is two thirds. You can check for the down quark. You end up getting minus one half, okay, plus one half times one third is one sixth. So you end up getting minus one third. And you can go through the charm quark. This will be giving you zero, okay. But then you get a a one uh, for the uh, you get a one for the charmedness, okay. And you get the the one third for the um, for for the the hypercharge, and then you can you add those together, divide by two, and then you add up, end up getting two thirds. Okay, um, now we can then uh, look at various reactions where we have the, for example, pi minus, which is u bar d plus proton, which is up up down in the simplest quark um, um, decomposition. Um, that can go to K0, which is the S bar, plus lambda, which is UDS. Okay. Um, these are what are called hyperons, by the way. Um, so basically what's going on here is that you're conserving the number of ups uh, where, in, where you can pair produce an up, an anti-up with an up, but the total number of ups minus the... For example, if you count the number of ups minus the number of anti-ups, it should be the same on one side and the other side. If you count the number of down quarks minus the number of anti-down quarks, it should be the same on the one side and the other side. So that's what's going on here with the conservation of upness or conservation of downness or strangeness, things like that. Okay. All right. Um, let's then go on. The... Um, so the pseudoscalar mesons are those with spin zero um, and, and have a p odd parity. So they get a minus sign under parity. Now, we know that the total angular momentum J is the combination of the orbital angular momentum and the total spin. But the total spin, then coming from the quarks, if you think of it in terms of a very simple quark model where you only have the quark and the antiquark, these this total spin would be just the sum of the, the quark spin and the anti-quark spin. This is actually a simplification of what's really going on, but um, it, it's one way to, to think about a very simple picture, a quark model, what's called a quark model picture, that people were thinking, uh, the way they were thinking back in the 60s. Okay? So this spin here can be either, if you have two spin one-half particles, you can have either a combination of spins, total spins, uh, the intrinsic spin, it, sorry, um, the the, uh, the the total intrinsic spin can be zero or one, okay. And so now the mesons they they will have uh, let's consider the simplest case where we just have the quark and an antiquark together, and there's no orbital motion of the of the quarks inside the meson. Then we have zero orbital angular momentum, okay. So then for the pion, if we have the pion is the case where the total intrinsic spin is equal to zero, and because there's no orbital angular momentum here, the total spin, total angular momentum will be equal to zero. J is equal to zero. Okay. Now, the, um, consequently, these pions are 
uh, are scalar in the sense that the the rotational properties are, are they, they they don't uh, change under rotations. However, their parity is is actually somewhat non-trivial. The parity of the pion is a combination is a product of the intrinsic parity of the quark and the antiquark, and it turns out that the quark has a positive parity and the antiquark has a negative parity to it. All right. Um, now the then the parity of this of the spatial wave function um, will. Well, okay, so, so the parity of spatial wave function is plus one because there is no orbital angular momentum, right? That's just minus one to the power L, or script L, the way it's written here. Um, but because the quark and the antiquark have opposite parities to them, the product of these gives me a minus sign. So the pion actually ends up having a negative parity, and so that's why it's called a pseudoscalar. The pseudo means it gets a minus one under parity. So these are the pseudoscalar mesons, and these happen to be the lowest-lying um, uh, hadronic states, the states that uh, particles that are, are, are formed by the strong interactions. Of all the particles you can produce, these are the, these are the lightest, the pseudoscalar mesons. Now, with the up, down, and strange quarks, we can construct nine pseudoscalar mesons. That's just saying we have three quarks and three antiquarks, so three times three is nine. And as I said before, that can decompose into an octet and a singlet. And you can see them sort of like this. Okay, we have for strangeness, um, S is equal to plus one, which means that you have one antiquark here, S bar, S bar. And you have then, you can have with the S bar with a D, or you can have S bar with a U, or you can have now uh, the strangeness equal to zero. And in that case, you can have um, uh, a pi minus, which is d u bar. You can have an eta, which is a u u bar or d d bar, or another combination, which was a pi minus, which would be u u bar minus d d bar. Um, and then you can also have u d bar. Right? There happens to be another one here, but that one actually corresponds with the singlet guy, and that's going to be the combination where you have um, u u bar plus d d bar bar plus s s bar all together. Um, that's what's noted here. You have the pi zero has this combination. You have the element of the octet of these eight guys. It looks like this. This is a traceless combination, meaning I add this coefficient, which is one plus one here, minus two is equal to zero. If I add one minus one is equal to zero, it's traceless. Right? Whereas this is not traceless. This is what's called the singlet for the SE3. Um, now, the, the remaining elements of the octet are down here with uh, strangeness equal to minus one, and that means you have one uh, strange quark, and so that's S U bar and S D bar. All right, it turns out that life is a little bit more complicated than this, so you can have this so-called eta octet and an eta singlet, but uh, because SU, this SU3 symmetry is not exact, the quark masses are not all the same, it turns out that the actual mass eigenstates, the things that you actually see um, as the particles propagate through space-time, are linear combinations of the eta eight and the eta zero. Or eta, the notation is kind of strange, but uh, this is the singlet eta eta zero written this way, and this angle turns out to be about minus fifteen degrees written this way. Okay, um, here's just a uh, comment that the eta was discovered from pi nuclei collisions at the Bevatron. Uh, at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs in 1961, and here are, by the way, the, the masses of the of the of the pseudoscalar mesons: uh, 497.6 uh, MeV, 493. So you can see they're kind of similar to each other. So all these guys, these belong to an isospin doublet. Okay, very similar in mass, and then you can see that the pions are very similar in mass. Um, so the pi plus is 139.57, the pi zero is 134.98, the pi minus has the same mass as the pi plus. The kaons, uh, these, these kaons here are, uh, have very, 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 these are antiparticles of these, this guy here, so it has a mass of 497.61, this has a mass of 493.68. Now the eta's are a little bit different because they involve some a mixture of the strange quarks, so they're a bit heavier. Um, so the eta is about 547.8 MeV, 
whereas the eta prime, which has a little bit more of the, the singlet uh, SU3 element, it's even higher in mass. And so that's 957.8 MeV for the eta prime. Okay, now let's take a look at what's going on with charge and parity together as a symmetry. Okay, so, so the K0 is interesting in that it, the, the, um, we have a down quark and an anti-strange quark. Um, notice that the, uh, the electric charge is going to be zero for this guy. However, the K0 bar is not the same as K0 because there are other quantum numbers other than just the charge, the electric charge. There's also the strangeness to it. And the strangeness here is one and the strangeness here is minus one. So the K0 bar is SD bar, which is different from K0. So now under charge conjugation, however, the particles go to the antiparticles. So K0 goes to K0 bar and K0 bar goes to K0. Now these guys are both pseudoscalar mesons, and so under parity, k0 goes to minus k0, and k0 bar goes to minus k0 bar. Now if we do co charge conjugation and parity together, then k0 goes to minus k0 bar, and k0 bar goes to minus k0. So, so these are not charge parity um, eigenstates. They, there's combinations of these two, symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations, that are CP, or charge parity eigenstates. And so if we make the symmetric combination, this is uh, so 1 over square root of 2 for normalization plus uh, times K0 plus K0 bar. This is what we call the K0 long combination. Okay, And now, if we go under, if we have the K0, uh, the other guy, which is called K0 short, and I'll explain why they're called long and short in just a moment, it's 1 over square root of 2, the orthogonal combination, K0 minus uh, K0 bar. Now, under charge parity, or CP, this K0 long, this goes to minus K0 bar, this goes to minus K0, so this goes into minus K long, K0 long. But K0 short, K0 goes into minus k0 bar, which is the term we have over here, whereas minus k0 bar will go into k0, which is the term we have here, so it actually gets a plus sign under CP. So as a result, these, uh, when they decay, so these guys will decay by the weak interactions, and if the weak interactions uh, preserve CP, right, if they preserve charge parity um, cons they conserve charge and parity together. Now, um, I should mention that's sort of an untrivial statement because the weak interactions actually violate parity very, very strongly. However, charge parity, it turns out that they respect charge parity quite well. It turns out not exactly, but it's actually very, very well. Um, and so, if, but if the weak interactions exactly preser preserve charge parity, CP, then the uh, K uh, short can decay into pi plus plus pi minus because um, the combination of pi plus with pi minus would be even under CP because we have two of these guys together. Okay, the, the, this under charge conjugation, um, these will go into each other, and, and under parity, uh, we won't have any minus signs either. Um, so, so, so this guy can go, can decay into two pi ions, and in fact, 69% of the time it goes to pi plus pi minus, 31% of the time it goes to pi zero pi zero. However, K long cannot decay into two pi ions because it has a different CP. So instead, what it must do is it must decay into three pi ions, uh, like this pi plus pi minus pi zero, or pi zero pi zero pi zero, or something else, what are called semi-leptonic decays, where we have pi plus, e, e minus e plus, um, an electron neutrino, or it's the same thing with the muon and the muon neutrino. Okay, so it, it, because this is a much more difficult process, um, these k-longs, and that's why they're k-longs, they live for a long, much longer time. So the lifetime for k-short is 8.95 times 10 to the minus 11 seconds. Okay, whereas uh, the lifetime for k long is 5.16 uh, 
uh, 5.116 times 10 to the minus 8 seconds. So that's, that's what is observed, that the, the K longs live a much longer time. However, however in 1964, um, an experiment by uh, Cronin and Fitch found that actually um, this, this K, it, when they looked at the beam line, 17, a, a rather long beam line, they, they found that, um, I'll just read this here, Given the disparity of the lifetimes of the two CAM species, you expect to see to see only the long-lived version at the end of the beam tube, but they found about one in 500 decays to be two pine decays, characteristic of the short-lived species. Okay, so the point is is that we have K longs living for a long time because otherwise the the population of the K shorts have died away. You know the lifetime. You wait long enough, and the probability that it's still there is, is almost nothing. And so after a very long time, you know that you have K-longs. But then you observe two pine decays, which you just said it's not supposed to do because of CP. But that is a hint, that's it's actually a smoking gun, that the weak interactions violate CP. And in fact, we understand this to be the case. Um, uh, that's actually uh, coming from this. Um, so this is the, the Nobel Prize for Cronin and Fitch. The, the observation uh, for James Watson Cronin and Val Logsdon Fitch for discovery of violations of fundamental symmetry, prin symmetry principles in the decay of the neutral K mesons. All right, so we now know that this is caused by the CKM matrix that we talked about before. And so remember, we said that the weak interactions mix up the, di the various different uh, quarks, right? So for example, uh, the up quark can couple to the down quark, uh, right? But it can also couple to the strange quark, and it also has a little bit of mixing to the bottom quark. It turns out that with a three by three matrix of, of these quarks having three generations, you end up, in general, if you think about sort of constructing matrices, random matrices, and, and, and trying to simplify things, you end up having some complex phases that you can never get rid of when you have this three by three matrix. And it's those phases in the CKM matrix, the, the, the Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa matrix, Kabibo by Yashi Maskawa matrix. Um, there, there's these phases, E to the I theta, these phases that actually um, produce the violation of CP. It turns out that CP gets violated when you have these complex phases if you can't make all the elements real at the same time by some symmetry transformation. So I think I'll stop there. Next time we'll, we'll talk about the, the vector mesons. So I'll see you then.